Sean Haney here with RealAgriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. I'm joined by Jacob Shapiro with Cognitive Investments based out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Hey, Jacob, how's it going? Uh, it's good. Uh, this is the part of the year where I'm miserable because of the weather and you guys are all outside having fun. Uh, so <laughs> the tables have turned since we last talked. It is a little bit of reversal. So um, you and I have agreed that we're going to we're gonna kind of break down the geopolitical situation because there is a lot of geopolitical overtones impacting farmers across Canada and the U.S. We're going to try to have these conversations once a month, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um let, let's start off with uh, – well, the one that everybody probably has it's, – it's, it's one that's covered the most is Russia-Ukraine. We had a renewal renewal of this grain deal right after it signed the 60-day extension. A lot of talk coming out of Ukraine that you know they're frustrating it. They're not letting ships through. It seems like it's not on. And, and now we're also hearing about Ukrainian forces sort of fighting some of this battle uh, across the, 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 the line on Russian territory. What exactly is happening now? between Russia and Ukraine? Well, l l let me start with a joke, Sean, that sort of relates directly to the grain deal, which is um, there's a guy walking down the street and he passes by an insane asylum and he just hears from the yard. He can't see into it, but he hears from the yard. They're all chanting 21, 21, 21 at the top of their lungs and curiosity gets the better of him. So he goes up, he can't see, it's blocked off by some kind of screen, but he sees there's a narrow slit here where if he can just get to the narrow slit, he can get in. 21 in the background. So he, he gets to the narrow slit, he looks in, and boom, a stick pokes him in the eye. And then they all start chanting, 22, 22, 22. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I say that to say with the, with the Black Sea grain deal, I mean, as soon as Russia approves every single extension, then Lavrov is out there saying, well, we really don't like this deal, though. And next time, we really aren't going to approve it. And he did that just last week. And I have trouble taking it seriously, but the flip side of that is the moment that you stop taking him seriously will probably be the moment that Russia withdraws from the deal, right? Um, I think the thing to think about with the Black Sea Grain Initiative in particular is that Russia tried to pull out in November, and not the Western countries, every other country in the world, your Brazils and South Africa's and your Indias, all of those countries, which for various pragmatic reasons, which we can get into if you want, have not condemned Russia's war or are not putting political pressure on Russia. Um, all of them said, hey, you're increasing food prices a lot if you're going to do this. We're not cool with that. You need to stick with the Black Sea Grain Initiative. So Russia doesn't have Europe anymore. It doesn't have the United States. It can't piss off the rest of the world by leaving the Black Sea Grain Initiative. So I think there's that constraint in place. The other thing is we had Turkish elections. Erdogan won. And Russia trusts Erdogan to, well, not trust is the wrong word, but they know that Erdogan is a pragmatist and that Erdogan is going to deal with them on a pragmatic basis. Whereas the Turkish opposition was really talking about, no, we're going to rejoin with NATO and the West and we're going to do everything the opposite of what Erdogan is doing. All of which is to say, Turkey is the real guarantor of that deal. And now that they have Erdogan in place, you know, I, I expect that the Black Sea Grain Initiative will probably remain in place. But zooming out for a bit with the Russia-Ukraine war itself, um, you know, for the first five, six months of the year, it's been relatively quiet. If you're paying attention to the war, there was the grisly battle for Bakhmut. Um, you could pay attention to some of these, you know, missile strikes and drone strikes here and what's happening. But it really has been, I don't want to say not an active conflict, but it hasn't been sort of at the level that it was this time last year. And all of that is because Ukraine is preparing for this counteroffensive against Russian forces. And what I would tell listeners is that I think we're finally getting in to where that counteroffensive is going to happen. Um, you probably know at the beginning of this week, there was that dam that was destroyed in southeastern yeah. Ukraine. I, I can't say for certain who did it, but I would guess it's the Russians, because the only reason you would break that dam is because you're afraid that Ukrainian forces are going to try to cross the river there so that they can cut off access to Crimea, because that's the land bridge to Crimea right there. And I think Russia's showing you when it's back against the wall, it is against the wall, when it's not doing well in the war, when it's now facing a new offensive from Ukraine that has new promises and commitments from Germany and the United States for an indefinite supply of weapons, the types of things that they're going to be willing to do to make sure that they can defend themselves from this Ukrainian offensive. And the you know the result of it is, you know, how tens of thousands of people displaced, how many millions of tons of crops in Ukraine destroyed. I mean, this is really, I think, just the beginning of a more active kinetic phase of this conflict. So sort of forget about the calm that we've had for the last six to seven months. I think that's where we're going. I would also tell you, though, and this is the flip side, I was arguing about this with another geopolitical strategist named Marco Papich, if your listeners have yep. um, heard of him. Um he thinks there's not going to be a counteroffensive. He thinks it's all a big dog and pony show to try and get political and economic support because he thinks an offensive would be 
suicide because he thinks the Russian bombers and fighters are just going to bomb Ukrainian forces across the border. I don't think that's correct, but you know that could be out there too. And if I'm wrong, uh, we if I'm wrong, we'll get to August and September, and you'll have me back on, and I'll be like, well, I guess that offensive didn't happen, and Marco was correct. But if if I was a Canadian farmer, I'd be looking for. You know, how is this war going to get worse? How is it going to affect grain, avail grain availability? What other things is Russia going to do when it's back against the wall that might affect global grain prices? Because that, I think, is the center of gravity, at least for Canadian farmers in the context of what's going on. Is there any reason for Russia to just sort of like walk away from this? It, it hasn't gone as at least we thought it was going to go and people have speculated the way they thought it was going to go. Is there any way they save face and just sort of say, well, that was fun um, and kind of go home or is the, are we setting in for however intense the fighting is, however large a counter offensive is yes or no, this is just the way it is for the years to come. There is every reason in the world for Russia to walk away from this. There was also every reason in the world for Russia not to do this. And I thought they weren't going to do it because I thought they were aware of all the reasons. This, I really think, comes down to Putin's regime. I think Putin has gone too far. I don't think he can turn back here. He has put too much of his credibility, too much of his future is based on success of this war. The question is, how long are the Russian people and how long is the Russian state around Putin going to tolerate continued failures here? Because you know the Russian economy has held up remarkably well, all things considered. But if oil prices are going to continue to swoon, if the Europeans and the Americans are going to continue to tighten sanctions, I mean, the, the Russians think that the Europeans are eventually going to start importing natural gas from them. They're, that's just wrong. The strategy is wrong, and Russia is not reversing course. So whether that happens in six months, whether it happens in 12 months, I thought it would have already happened already. But there's obviously every reason for Russia to stop because it looks like they're going to lose. If, you know, uh, I alluded to this already, but just a couple of weeks ago, Germany came out and said, all right, we're going to have 3 billion euros of weapons, worth of weapons that we're going to deliver to Ukraine. And we're going to start JVs in Ukraine so that they can learn how to service their own tanks and build their own tanks and things like that. And to put that in perspective, 3 billion euros worth of weapons from Germany, that's more than they've sent Ukraine in the entire conflict so far. And when this war started, a month before the war started and Ukraine was warning that Russia was going to invade, uh, I don't know if your listeners remember this. I remember it because the Germans said, all right, we're going to send 5,000 helmets to Ukraine. We don't want to send offensive weapons, but they they might need the helmets. So we've gone from Germany sending helmets to, hey, we're setting up companies on the ground in Ukraine that can service the tanks that we're going to give them. Th that doesn't work for Russia. Russia's in a fight that it really can't win. So um, it has every reason to, to walk away. And as long as Putin is in control, they probably won't. Does China have any say at all in what Russia does, or are people making too big of a deal of of somehow she being the puppet master on what Putin does or doesn't do? I don't know that China has say in what Putin does. It certainly has leverage and influence because the Russian economy likely would have already collapsed if it were not for China opportunistically. Uh, being willing to buy and import lots of cheap Russian commodities, but most countries would do that. If you, if your, <laughs> if your neighbor suddenly couldn't sell to their normal customer and had to sell you wheat and platinum and whatever oil, natural gas for pennies on the dollar, you would probably take them up too. So there's that pragmatic thing going on there with China. Um, I'm a little confused about China though. Uh, and I think they might be a little bit confused themselves. You've seen them hedging their bets in the last couple of months. So Xi Jinping finally had a phone call with Zelensky and has pledged an envoy to try and get some kind of peace agreement going. It's not going anywhere, but you can see that China's trying to maintain relations with Ukraine and prepare for, oh, well, what if Ukraine is here for a while? What if Russia's not here for a while? Then flip side, I was just arguing with an analyst on my team about this earlier today, not arguing, really just trying to figure out what the heck was going on. There was a report that China's sending armored personnel carriers, selling them to the Chechens. So it's not officially to the Russian government, but it's to the Chechen Republic and which is led by Kadriov, who is under Putin's umbrella right now. So those will probably go into service for the Russian military. Now we're flirting very closely with China arming Russia in the context of the war. And that's been a red line for the West from the beginning. And that doesn't make sense to me, because if we're just doing straight geopolitics, the thing that China does not want is a failed state with nuclear weapons on its border. What it needs yeah. is for Russia to be independent, to stand up against the United States, to give the United States another problem to think about. Because if Russia collapses, number one, you share a huge border with them. So that that instability is going to come over into your neck of the woods as well. And number two, as long as Russia's there, the United States can't focus completely on the Pacific and can't focus completely on the trade war with China, which is really causing damage in the Chinese economy. So 
I, I'd be lying to you if I had real certainty about why China's doing what it's doing. It seems to be doing all of those things at the same time. It looks to me, maybe they're hedging their bets. Maybe the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Maybe they're as confused as we are about why the war is continuing to go on. But the last point I would just say is, I don't think it's as simple as if Xi Jinping told Putin to stop, would Putin stop? Okay. Probably not. He would probably hasten Putin's demise because Putin would continue going on. But I don't think it is as simple as Xi controlling the strings over there. Well, and the commodity market is concerned. Um, I think Canadian and U.S. egg exporters are concerned. But what's happening with the Chinese economy, period? You know, weak manufacturing numbers, things are not running at the clip economically that uh, many had forecasted. Uh, this is going to be one of, I think, one of the big question marks in the back half of 23 into Q1, Q2 of 24. Yeah, well, let me let me push back against that a little bit, because I think the expectations for the reopening were wildly optimistic. Almost okay. people were expecting, oh, my God, we're going to get China like it's going to be back to normal, except also with a 2008 level stimulus and you know, all this pent up energy, but it doesn't really work that way. And that's because China's really metabolizing some serious economic problems. Uh, and it has, some of it has to do with the trade war. Some of it has to do with demographics. Um, just look also at what the Chinese government is doing. Um, they're exerting political control over different parts of the economy. So two years ago, it was the tech executives and the major Chinese tech companies. Last year around this time, we would have been talking about the real estate property developers and bringing them to heel. Now they're going after local governments, which have racked up a lot of debt because they're in this real estate bubble as well. So all of these different things China is doing, try and crack down on the economy. It's just that, yes, the, the data is disappointing if you thought the data was going to be absolutely perfect. To me, the data is sort of middling. It's not great. It's not bad. It's sort of there in between. Then the other thing is, when it comes to commodities, China still needs the commodities. It's still going to be building infrastructure. You still have to feed a billion people. And you've probably seen the weather in China has been really bad the last couple of weeks. We've got you know, inundating rains in some parts of the country. We've got really dry, hot weather in other parts of the country. And you're beginning to see this narrative take hold of, well, is China going to have to import more wheat? Is it going to have to import more ag commodities? Now, there was a similar narrative last year, and then China magically said, oh, if we figured it out. Don't worry. Our yields were fine. But you're getting that same kind of um, story there as well. So I, I'm not, for me, I'm not worried about the Chinese economy necessarily. I think it's it may not be as good as everybody was hoping for with the reopening. I am worried about what kind of economic impact will the crackdown on local governments and local government officials have? Because when you start you know, using politics instead of economics to dictate how the market is going to work, that's where you could have problems. But that's where I would focus. Not so much on the, you know, the PMI data, all those other things like that. It's not terrible. It's it's also not great. It's just kind of in the middle. Yeah. And is it it's hard to sort of synthesize and try to sort out the truth, false sort of maybe hyperbole on data that comes out of China in, in some of these regards, too, or not? Well, like, like most countries, China is just a little more um, extreme about it. I mean, all of this data is on a certain level manufactured, so it's hard to take any of the data at face value. And sometimes um, sometimes the hyperbole is correct. Sometimes the data is extreme in one direction or not. Um, you can make a major mistake with data by saying, well, it's probably not this, it's probably not that, so I'm just going to take the middle and take an average, and that's going to be fine. That's also probably the wrong thing to do. The best thing you can do is try and get a finger on the pulse and say, well, are they buying? Are they consuming? And that, I think, if you're looking at what Chinese people are doing, the Chinese government's trying to get them to spend more, and Chinese people are not spending more because they're nervous about the future. And so China's continuing to say, okay, fine, like we're going to cut deposit rates this week was the biggest thing. Still not quite doing it. Still Chinese savers are, are not really making it move. Um, what China's trying to do is um, they don't want to take out the 2008 level fiscal stimulus bazooka to get the economy going again. They want to try to do this in a little bit more of a sustainable basis. And that's that's the catch-22 with financial reporting about China. Everybody freaks out about China when it doesn't take out the fiscal stimulus bazooka like, like it did in 2008. Um, but I guarantee you, if they have to go that route, immediately you'll see articles about, oh, China debts up to 300% of GDP, and oh my God, they're being so irresponsible and probably what they're spending. So I, I think there is an extreme in the media reporting there. But as, as far as Chinese data goes, look, you, I use the data that they publish because that tells me something about what they want the world to see. And then you just have to talk to your contacts on the ground and, and figure out some sense of what's going on. And that's the best you can do. We're sure hearing a lot in Canada about election interference 
uh, as it as it pertains to to China and um, you know certain interference with uh, MPs, uh, members of Parliament. Uh, it's getting a lot of coverage here. Um, maybe Canada really in a situation where I don't know. They, we just never seem to know what to do with the relationship with China, right? Like we we're export heavy. We also realize, like, you think about it from academia standpoint, how much money comes to Canadian universities from China. Like, it, it's like a situation where we just don't want to ever, we want to be hawkish. We want to be like tougher, but it, it's maybe it's sort of the Canadian personality. We just don't have it in us. Like, we're just sort of, we, we you know, one time we arrested a Huawei CFO. That was maybe the, the toughest, one of the toughest things we've ever done. We sent a diplomat back. Um, there was that, um, but I, I yeah, think but you, but, but you, you didn't arrest the Huawei CFO because the Canadian government decided to want to get hawkish no, Trump on told China. <laughs> it wasn't even Trump told you to, like, I, I believe it was the district attorney for New York. I mean, it was, it was a bureaucratic move because you had a real, I mean, you had a, um, an allegation and a summons from the United States and you had a treaty with the United States that said you had to honor it. So you did it because the United States told you to, and then the United States sort of left you hanging. And yeah. this, I mean, this goes back to. What we're talking about right now in terms of Canada may not know what to do with China and also just has terrible timing. So you're right about this election interference story. I've been following it myself and I'm shocked, shocked to find that there is election interference from China in Western countries. Like I guarantee you we're interfering in their things too. Maybe not the Canadians as much, but in the United States, we're interfering in elections all over the world. Like I'm always waiting for somebody's point when they, when they say, oh, well, they're interfering in our elections. Like, yeah, okay. Like that's why we have, you know voter rolls and all these institutions that are supposed to legitimate elections and things like that. But at, at the same time that arguably Canada's getting, uh, that Canada is getting peak hawkish on China, what is the messaging out of the White House? The White House is saying, oh, we've gone too far. We want to yeah. thaw in relations with China. We're going to send Blinken over there later this month because we want to talk to the Chinese. Biden's really worried that he's starting a second Cold War and he wants to walk it back. So uh, time, I the good news for Canada, I think, is I think it's not going to work. Like uh, the as as we say, at least back home on my farm, like the horse is already bolted out of the barn. There's no putting it back. Um, but it, it is funny to me that just as this election interference and this China hawkishness is coming in Canada, it looks like the White House has decided, oh, we're actually going to try and be nice to China for a change, at least rhetorically. Well, and meanwhile, former USTR Robert Lighthizer was it two weeks ago, basically said, you know, in regards to these tariffs, who the U.S. is re, you know reevaluating. I double them, <laughs> right? So yeah. uh, th I thought those were some, pr I don't know if you saw that interview with Lighthizer and some of the comments that he made, but. Um... Well, I, I almost can't, I almost can't pay attention to former White House officials and federal, because the current officials are also saying all those sorts of things. So even as Biden is leaking to the Washington Post about he wants a thaw and he doesn't want a second uh, Cold War, except this time with China, you know, what else has happened this week? You've also got the United States pursuing a trade deal with Taiwan, a country that it ostensibly doesn't even recognize. You've got the United States saying it's going to connect naval reconnaissance drones on the same network for the United States, Japan, and Taiwan. Um, you've got the United States adding more Chinese companies to the entity list, you know, sort of cracking down. So even as you have the White House saying one thing, if you actually look at all the things that the different departments in the United States are doing with regards to China, it's all hawkish. It's all yeah. doubling down on the relationship itself. So um, it's not if if Lighthizer wants want, Lighthizer wants to say double the tariffs. Okay, like like Biden will probably double the tariffs on his own without any sort of prodding from former White House officials. There's been a lot of mainstream coverage this week of Saudi Arabia. Um, they are really in the news, uh, and it's it's weird. It's a lot of it's from a sporting standpoint. Of mm. we had the merger, or some people say it's not a merger. Maybe it's Saudi Arabia acquiring the PGA Tour. Uh, PGA Tour, you know, getting a lot of investment. President of the board is going to be, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, from Saudi Arabia. Um, he's also, uh, I think, owner of the Newcastle Football Club, Newcastle mm -hmm. United. Um, what, what do we make of what Saudi Arabia is doing? They're throwing a lot of money around in the sports arena. Well, it's better that they're throwing money around in the sports arena than in a grisly humanitarian catastrophe of a civil war in Yemen and supporting their faction without getting anything to it. I guess that's progress of a kind. Um, I think what Saudi Arabia is doing, I mean, we have to go back a, a couple of years here for this, and Canada has a front row seat for this. I, I actually, I want to send the Saudis a thank you for escalating this in the last week or two, because it's a really good subject for our first uh, version of these chats. 
Um, but, you know, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who was basically the leader of Saudi Arabia, he was declared the Crown Prince, I believe it was 2018, when Canada-Saudi relations nosedived. Um, and that was, you know, Trudeau is still in a majority government at this point. He's still fairly early on. He sees himself now as the representative of the true liberal world because he's got Trump down in the United States. He's really feeling himself. Um, and you've got this situation where Mohammed bin Salman, he's just acting out all over the place. He's a young 30-something-year-old who's now the leader of Saudi Arabia, and you've got the Jamal Khashoggi thing. And you've got all these things that's going on with Saudi Arabia. They've got their war in Yemen. They're doubling down on their conflict with Iran. And amidst all this, a Canadian uh, foreign ministry makes a tweet about human rights activists and women's was, rights activists Christina in Saudi Freeland. Arabia. It was our current yeah. finance minister. And Mohammed bin Salman freaks out and says, enough, no diplomatic relations with Canada. You may not insult Saudi Arabia this way. Of course, we have human rights and it's no, none of your business, blah, blah, blah. Um, fast forward a couple of years, you can see how much Mohammed bin Salman has changed and how much Saudi Arabia has changed, because it's not just Canada that Saudi Arabia has mended ties with recently. I already mentioned Jamal Khashoggi. He was the Saudi journalist who was dismembered uh, yeah. in Turkey by Saudi security forces. Uh, that caused a lot of problems between Turkey and Saudi Arabia, very tense relations there for years. Uh, earlier this year, though, uh, Turkey needed money. Erdogan made up with the crown prince and the Saudis deposited $5 billion in their foreign accounts. And they needed it because their, their, res their reserves are net negative now. You had Saudi Aramco uh, in Turkey, uh, an official from Saudi Aramco in Turkey last week, soliciting investment proposals, tens of billions of dollars from Turkish contractors to build things in the kingdom itself. You've got um, at the apparently at the urging of China, uh, reestablishment of diplomatic ties between Saudi Arabia and Iran, mortal enemies, Arab versus Persian, Sunni versus Shiite. They've been at each other's throats for literally years and suddenly no, All right. Well, the Chinese have brokered this peace thing. So the Saudi Arabians are going to be Saudi Arabians are going to be magnanimous and say no more. And also can't gets wrapped into this. So suddenly, you know what, like. We don't need this diplomatic problem with Canada. Uh, we'd like to have a better, more you know, productive relationship. You have things that we want to buy anyway. We're sure you want to sell to our markets. Why don't we just let bygones be bygones? Um, and I, I do think it's also interesting just to think in terms of the evolution of both Trudeau and Mohammed bin Salman since 2018. I mean, Trudeau now, leader of a minority government, has been beset with all kinds of setbacks and controversies about his foreign policies. And Mohammed bin Salman, who has since crushed all resistance to him and now is governing more like a statesman rather than sort of a precocious adolescent who suddenly finds himself in power in Saudi Arabia. Um, so there's a real acceptance, I think, of the realities of geopolitics and that the world is messy and you have to be pragmatic in this world where a Saudi Arabia is no longer tied to the United States, no longer tied directly to China trying to make its own way and reconfigure its own policy to be completely independent. And the, the last thing I'll say is I, the reason Saudi Arabia has to go and try and attract Ronaldo and, and, you know, buy up the PGA tour. Um, I was joking with you before we got on, I'll say it again. I'm really glad Messi told the Saudi Arabians to go fuck themselves. It's nice that somebody doesn't want that Saudi cat that also spoken from somebody who never. So if they want to throw some my way, I totally wouldn't be against that. That's fine with me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. they don't have a lot of soft power right now. I mean, they have a medieval theocratic society where they are still chopping people's hands off or stealing things at the market where women have to cover themselves completely and can't drive their own cars. Um, so, you know, if you want to be cool, if you want to have a better public relations image, why not buy the PGA Tour and make it a soccer mecca? They're probably going to come after my beloved sport of basketball next. Yeah, they, they offered Messi 1 billion euro. He turned it down and went to Inter Milan. Or sorry, um, Inter Miami is that what we call it? Inter Miami. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I get confused. We're copying all the names. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess, are they on their own? Like, so you know, in this sort of, we try to it seems stage things like U.S. China, pick your side. Where where are they? Are they just sort of like floating as a different moon, kind of a, around those two orbits? Well, some of your listeners may have seen me or heard me talk before. And one of the that I always use polarity. So I think anybody who's out there who says we're in just a U.S.-China Cold War, there might actually be a Cold War between the U.S. and China, but that's not what the global system looks like right now. It's not going to be like the 1950s and 60s where the Soviet Union and the United States were the two dominant powers in the world. We've also moved away from a system where the United States is the one dominant power in the world. I mean, go back 20 years, um, Saudi Arabia was arguably the United States' most important relationship 
uh, because the United States was importing lots of oil from the Middle East. Now, we've, since then, we've had the shale revolution. There have even been months in recent years where the United States hasn't imported a barrel of oil at all from Saudi Arabia. Go back and tell yourself that 20 years ago or 30 years ago it would have been absolutely insane. Now China is um, the Saudi's top customer. But the point I'm making is, and if I'm right about this multipolar world thesis, what that means is you're going to get different powers around the world with their own spheres of influence. So it's not going to be, am I aligned with the US or am I aligned with China? It's going to be, well, okay, I need to have relations with the US for this reason. I need to have relations with China for this reason. By the way, India, which has historically exerted more of an economic influence on the region than China, if you really want to do your history, like we need a good relationship with them, even though they're a Hindu nationalist country that's doing all sorts of weird things that would make a Muslim power upset. Probably need good relations with Brazil and Russia. We also have to talk to them a little bit too. The Saudis have been co coordinating with the Russians. Um, they've been buying Russian oil and then selling their own oil for more expensive rates on the market. So when you sort of put it together, it's not about picking a side. It's about not having to pick a side. It's about doing whatever Saudi Arabia needs to do. Now, the problem with that is that Saudi Arabia has generally needed security guarantees from a country like the United States to exist, because even though they import lots of fancy weapons from the United States and also from Canada, uh, they don't have the soldiers that know how to use them. Certainly not that can compete against a power like Iran or even like in Iraq or Syria. Those are armies and forces that scare the Saudis in general. Um, so that's why the, the Saudi Arabia U.S. relationship existed. Um, the United States got its oil from Saudi Arabia. In return, Saudi Arabia got weapons and a U.S. security guarantee. That's kind of gone and it's a precarious position from that point of view for Mohammed bin Salman, but he's betting that if he can be the sort of center of finance and technology dynamism in the heart of the Gulf and use all of that oil money for as long as it lasts to pivot, um, that Saudi Arabia can be sort of a neutral power in the region and can get rich and wealthy and influential just on that. Um, it's an audacious plan. I don't know if it's going to work for him, um, but I think that's what he's going for. It's like a trust fund kid that doesn't have a limit on a bank account. Well, he, he's the ultimate trust fund kid, but yeah, the yeah. Saudis also like the, the Saudis did realize there was a limit. So if again, if let's go back to 2018, 2019, oil prices were swooning. Remember that before, right before the COVID-19 pandemic really caused lockdowns in the Western world, the biggest news of March 2020 before COVID was price war between Saudi Arabia and Russia over oil because oil was hanging out around $20, $25 a barrel. Um, for the for the years leading up to 2020, um, Saudi Arabia was burning through hundreds of billions of dollars of reserves because oil prices were low and they were funding all of these different insurgencies over the Middle East. They had their civil war in Yemen. They were responsible for you know helping the Egyptians and helping the Pakistanis with all of their funds and things like that. I mean, they were appreciably going through the trust fund. So one of the things Mohammed bin Salman had to do is, all right, stop the bleeding with the trust fund. Stop the war that we're not winning in Yemen. We're not going to write checks for the Pakistanis and Egyptians anymore. That doesn't do anything for us. We'll write a check for the Turks because they'll build things and they're more geopolitically significant. But what is the Pakistani relationship going to get us? Nothing. Um, all of which is to say um, Mohammed bin Salman is a trust fund baby, but he also came into power right when the trust fund started vanishing. And he is trying to pivot Saudi Arabia towards no, we have to be more responsible. We can't just be an oil-based economy. And I mean, he's he's got all the right ideas. There's a reason that Saudi Arabia has become a darling of the investment world because people buy all these you know slideshows and decks that they're building about mm -hmm. Vision 2030 and cities in the desert and things like that. Um, I have my doubts. I'm not really sure how it's going to play out. I think the fact that you're in the desert and you've got a society that is, I mean, you know, it's it's not a when I say it's a medieval theocratic society, that's not hyperbole. I mean, that's really what it is. So you're telling me that we're going to go in a span of five years from women can't drive and have to be separated to, you know, tech super capital of the world. I mean, I, I kind of find that hard to believe, but that's at least what he's driving to. And the point I just wanted to make there was the trust fund is not unlimited. And I I, I probably am. You know, if you ask how long hydrocarbons are going to dominate the economy, I'd probably take the over in terms of years. Mm -hmm. But eventually, oil will not be the only source of energy in the world. And the day that that happens, if Saudi Arabia has not developed a more stable, modern economic base than that, they'll go back to just being a desert that nobody cares about. So that's that's the clock that he's racing against because he knows that if if his progeny is going to have their own trust fund, it can't just be business as usual. Curious in a multipolar world. Which countries come to mind being the most difficult spot? The most difficult spot? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, a country like Russia, for obvious reasons, um, really bad demographics, uh, 
you know, uh, overly dependent on commodities, doesn't have its own tech, uh, all those other sorts of things. China has a big problem there too, although I think China will be able to muddle through. Um, another, another thing to look for with countries that are not going to do well are those that politically can't execute on policies. So India is a good example of this. I go back and forth about whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic about India. And with India, it all comes down to, can the Indian government do what it says it's going to do? If they can, they have a lot of advantages. But the problem for India for decades has been they've known what they need to do. They know what infrastructure they need to build. They know what market reforms they need to make. The politics have just never allowed them to do it. So if you're looking, for example, countries like South Africa, countries like Argentina, these are countries that politically have never shown the ability to actually execute on policies. And we are going through a period of immense change. Um, and you know, if you don't have the politics to go with that, you're going to have trouble. The last thing I'll say is that generally in history, um, those countries that have the securest supply and the cheapest supply of food and energy do well because they have surplus capital that then they can spend on a military or on economic development or research and development and technology. Um, so if you're a country that does not have food or you're forced to import lots of energy from abroad, those are things that are going to make you less competitive in this multipolar universe that we're talking about. Puts Canada and the U.S. in a pretty good position based on that description. The United States and Canada are in a tremendous position if your goal is to be prosperous and to enjoy safety and security and economic prosperity. It's not a good position if in the United States you want to continue being the global hegemon. And this is the real problem with Western politics and with the United States in general. The United States has gotten used to this idea that it is the most powerful country in the world, that it is a light to the nations, that everybody wants life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness served with a side of you know, McDonald's French fries. Um, so if, if, if what you want is to be prosperous, sure, like the United States and Canada have so many things going for them. Most leaders in the world, I say this to audiences all the time, uh, US audiences and Canadian audiences, because I think a lot of us are you know, concerned about our politics right now, concerned mm. about the world and concerned about polarization. Most leaders in the world would love to have the problems that we have in the United States and Canada. Most leaders in the world are facing, I don't have enough calories here that I can grow in this country to feed my people. I don't have enough energy here to actually keep the air conditioning on during the heat wave. We don't have any of those problems. Our problems are all squabbles with each other. So um, yeah, the United States, Canada, Australia, the, the English speaking world, there's a reason that we've come to such prominence in the world. And there's a reason that things are going to continue going well, as long as we don't decide that we have to go fight wars in places that don't mean anything to us. And that's U.S. history over the past 20 years is fighting wars that didn't actually do anything for the United States uh, because it, it felt like it needed to be the dominant global power. Jacob, this is awesome. I can't, I can't believe we've got to wait a month to have the next one, but uh, I'm really looking forward to these these conversations. There is so much of this that, uh, although it feels far away, it very, very much works its way very quickly back to the farm gate, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing this every month with you. I'm looking forward to it too, and, and maybe just to close, because we did get a little highfalutin there and abstract, but it, it really is an abstract, and I'll just give your listeners two examples to chew on as they go, one historical and one present day. Um, historical, I've, I've been rereading um, Baklav Smil's, um, it's the book about energy and civilization, I'm forgetting the exact title off the top of my head, and I knew this obviously, but he reminded me that um, you know nitrogen-based fertilizers and the things that we use to have such great yields and crops today, where does that come from? Well, it comes from creating ammunition supplies during World War One. Like we didn't create fertilizer and then apply that technology to create ammunition. We use technology to create ammunition. And we're like, oh, we can also use that for fertilizer. So like geopolitics has always been inextricably linked with agriculture. And for Canadian farmers in particular, the Saudi story is so important because for the last couple of years, you haven't been able to export to Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia didn't want to buy anything from you because of this diplomatic squabble. But if you live in a world where you can't depend on the Chinese market long term, no matter what you think about Saudi Arabia and their approach to human rights and women's rights, that's a market you can sell to. That's 30, 40 million people living in the desert who I don't care how, even if they're wildly successful with Vision 2030, let's say I'm wrong about my pessimism about Saudi Arabia, they're going to have to, they're going to have to get grain from somewhere. And if you're a Canadian farmer, do you want your government making sure that you can be the one that exports grain to Saudi Arabia? Or do you want your government to be the one like Messi who tells the Saudis to go fuck themselves? I can make the argument either way, but those are the very real choices that are in front of us in terms of how we choose our politicians and how we make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
Um, you, we have to be in the clouds and abstract and think from that macro perspective, but I hope in these conversations, we can bring it down and make it clear to Canadian farmers why this matters to them and why you should be tracking this, why it's not just situational awareness, but actually is going to impact you on a practical level. Yeah, we're going to cross post these episodes. So uh, for people who have been following Cognitive Investments and some of the podcast work you've been doing, uh, you can find more of our stuff at realagriculture.com. Uh, and if you're listening to this through Real Agriculture, of course, uh, definitely I encourage you to check out Jacob's podcast uh, as well. What's the name of the podcast again, Jacob? Cognitive Dissidence. Perfect. So it's Cognitive Distance or Dissidence. So check it out, everybody. Okay, Jacob, thanks a lot. Thanks, Sean. Talk to you next month.